So I think health is a lot more of like a, a holistic approach. And I think it's all about really understanding your body and your body sensations and just being more mindful. I can't emphasize that enough. Like just being aware of what's happening below mm-hmm. your shoulders. <laughs> just feel it. It doesn't it doesn't have to be a jackhammer before you have something going on with your health. Like it's it's always talking to you. This is the Anthropology Podcast. The podcast where we optimize the bodies, brains, and lifestyles of entrepreneurs, go-getters, and world-changing innovators. Welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Walker. As an anthropologist and naturopathic doctor, I work with entrepreneurs and go-getters to optimize the health and performance of these world-changing innovators. Before we jump into the interview, I want to invite you to join our free Facebook community, Legacy. If you want to be something amazing, you need to surround yourself with amazing people. The Legacy community is made up of badass women living, not leaving, but living our legacy every single day. We are leaders, parents, entrepreneurs, and innovators collectively committed to leaving the world better than we found it. My mission is to support the health and optimization of these badass superheroes, literally to places we never thought imaginable. If you are on a mission and get it that your health is the key to your unlimited potential, then join us. We are super awesome. You can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash DE legacy. See you there. Today, I sat down with Adele Tevlin of Adele Wellness. Adele is a weight loss coach, a cognitive behavioral therapist, and holistic nutritionist. And she has a really unique program and approach to helping people manage your weight. Although we did talk about how to lose weight effectively, because it's something we are both asked so frequently about in our own practices, what the conversation really got into was how do we manage our body image? How do we optimize our energy? And what are the thought patterns that get us into this problem in the first place. We looked at weight loss, not as an overconsumption of calories, but on a desperate desire for dopamine. This means that weight management, body management, and getting to your ideal place starts with your brain. Let's call this the brain diet and let's get into it right away. Adele Tevlin, it's so great to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here on the podcast with you. Well, this is a really um, interesting topic to delve into, and and we're gonna we're gonna talk about weight loss, and not from a the ketogenic diet and the paleo diet and the run and then walk and then carbs after like we are going to talk about it where it really all starts which is in the brain and you are passionate about helping people lose weight for the right reasons and the right way can you explain what you do and how you got here Mm -hmm. you know okay so what I do and how I got here so you know I call myself a weight loss coach which I often really struggle with just even you know, what I call myself, but really, truly what I do is I help people understand the cognitions and the thoughts that get in the way of what they really want. So basically what I do is I really help people, um, understand their patterns, their triggers around food, sort of what are the things that are getting in their way of their goals? You know, at the end of the day, a lot of people, and most people know what they should and shouldn't be eating and what they should and shouldn't be doing behavior wise. But there's a huge disconnect between what I call the knowing and doing gap. So my role uh, as a weight loss coach, and, and I'm, my background is a certified nutritional practitioner. I graduated from the Institute of Holistic Nutrition, and I have a background in neuropsychology from McGill, and I'm a practitioner of, of cognitive behavioral therapy. So really what I do is amalgamate all of these different tools from my toolbox, and I've created what I think is a very sustainable way for people to lose weight. Um, to your point, like you said, Megan, not about just ketogenic or paleo or this or that, but really getting to the root cause of why uh, they're overeating in the first place. Okay. So why are people overeating in the first place? (laughs) Well, in 10 seconds or less, (laughs) basically, you know, people are looking for dopamine hits. And so we have a very much a reward center at the prefrontal cortex of our brain and we're addicted to food. We're addicted to a lot of things. And so I look, I treat sort of, uh, the way I look at nutrition is from a food addiction perspective. So people are overeating because they're looking for that high, the same high they get from drugs and alcohol or from using their cell phones or Instagram likes on their feed or, um, all that. So it's, it's really all about that reward center in the frontal lobe of their brain. And how else, 
how else can we stimulate that? How do we get away from food? Is it because we eat food three times, four times, 10 times a day that that is such a problem for us? Or do we see weight loss in, or so do we see like the equivalent to weight gain from food from playing on Instagram or doing other things that trigger dopamine? So are you asking why we get dopamine hits from food? Well, I guess I'm kind of asking is like, what's the equivalent to weight gain Mm -hmm. in other areas of our life? Hmm. Well, it would be like, you know, an alcoholic who's who's uh, drinking too much alcohol, or it would be those people that are on their phones constantly. There's actually a research research done right now um, around the same uh, areas of the brain, specifically uh, the nucleus accumbens, which is a part of the brain that um, really gets fired up when people do drugs or drink alcohol. And there's actually studies that show that you know, teenagers that are looking on Instagram, they get this same heightened sense, uh, the same parts of the brain get lit up, lit up when um, they look at their Instagram feeds and they get more likes. So this is like a big part of research that's just getting started around uh, food addiction. And we know that it triggers that same frontal prefrontal cortex. And really why is because the foods that people love to eat are called hyper palatable foods. So they're a combina- combination of sugar, fat, and salt. And so that combination of foods, like the deadly trio, I like to call, is actually in the DSM, by the standard of the DSM, more addictive than most drugs. So we are actually sometimes at a disadvantage. So we might know that, you know, it's not great to eat donuts, but we're just so driven to eat those foods because of what's happening at the level of the brain. So we're after dopamine and some of us are susceptible to food. Well, we're after dopamine. Some of us are susceptible to food and some of us are more susceptible to needing more dopamine. So what's actually happening is people that have lower levels of dopamine in their brains in general. So this could be like a history of addiction in the family or whatnot um, are more tempted to go get it from somewhere. And sometimes what happens is people that drop one addiction have a replacement behavior to another addiction. I'm sure you've seen that before too, where they, you know, they'll quit smoking, but then they'll become addicted with the gym or they'll stop drinking, but they'll eat more sugar because it's sort of like they're still looking for that high. Yeah, absolutely. And the interesting thing about this population and entrepreneurs and go getters Mm -hmm. is people who say yes all the time and people who start new businesses. That's a that's a dopamine rush, too. They're all dopamine junkies. Yeah. So it might not be weight, but it might be Mm -hmm. I can't say no, I can never say no. It's the same pathway that you're uh, that you're lighting up. What what characteristics have you found then in in your client population that distinguish those who are successful in their weight loss quest versus Mm -hmm. those who are on a perpetual diet? Mm-hmm. It's so funny you asked me this. I was actually speaking with a client earlier today about this. And I think that the, so most all of my clients are entrepreneurs, much like your same demographic. So very much type A personality. Um, and so what I find to be the differentiate, like the thing that really differentiates the clients that are successful versus not, and I would define success by following the program, you know, being consistent, being accountable, not having that level of attrition would really be their readiness and their willingness to be coachable and to be ready to get on that journey. So, you know, it's kind of like akin to, you know, you can give them a great protocol, but if they're not ready to make those changes, it doesn't matter how great that protocol is. They really have to get to that point where they're like, I'm ready. I'm done. I'm tired of living this way. I want change. I'm going to be coachable and I'm really going to take your instruction. Those are the people that succeed. The people that are there because their wife or husband said you should go or the doctor forced their hand or they feel like it's a should as opposed to a want. Those are the people that are constantly like on different fad diets and they try this and they try that and nothing really sticks because they're not truly committed. So I'd say that commitment and like readiness would be the thing that really distinguishes that. And what does it take? So I'm just thinking about Mm -hmm. all the committed people who are ready to be coached on Mm -hmm. December 23rd every year. (laughs) And then by February 1st, they're like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm super stressed again. So like there's the I'm ready to be coached. And then there's like, no, 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 seriously, my life is shifting. I am I am ready for something better. Mm -hmm. What? Do you see something in those people? I mean, I have thoughts about what I see in my practice, but I'm really curious what mm-hmm. uh, who those those people are. Like, what is that little shift of difference? What can people recognize in themselves to know that they're not caught in another December 23rd moment? <laughs> Just like a New Year's resolution, you mean? Yeah. Well, I think I really do think it's it's that it's the commitment. I don't actually think that it's whether it's the December 23rd. And you know, it's funny. People often say to me, "What's your busiest time of year?" 
And as much as you think it's the New Year's resolutioners, it's actually not necessarily true. I just think that people come to this point where they say, I've had enough. I'm tired of looking at myself. You know, often people see pictures of themselves and say, wow, like I can't believe that's me. Or they just feel so terrible all the time. Um, and they know that there's, they know they've been perpetually yo-yo dieting and they just want something sustainable. My business is essentially word of mouth. So they might have known someone that got success with me. So, you know, I really do think that what di distinguishes the people that are ready on the 23rd of December and then, you know, fall off by February is that they're still not fully committed. They're not 100% ready to give up what they have to give up. You know, I often ask people, what's the cost and reward of what you're doing? So people will always do behavior as long as there's a reward. Even if the reward doesn't seem like a good reward, they're going to do that behavior until they don't get that reward anymore. So I think what it really comes down to is people are kind of like, I'm done. And when they're done, they're ready. Yeah, sure. And it's a pain pleasure thing, right? And I can't totally, I, I, you sh I'm sure you see this too, where people think, oh, eating healthy, it is so awful. Look, I'm a foodie. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't <laughs> eat that way. And then I heard on the radio on the way here, 50% of the population doesn't know how to boil an egg. Mm -hmm. yes. what, so, right? So like, how do we, what is it? Do we, what comes first, psychology or food yes. or is there psychology? Any, yes. Okay. So what I do in my practice too, like from the CBT perspective is that you know, the whole model of CBT is based on this very one specific um, theory, which is not even theory, but this point is that when you know what someone's thinking, you understand their behavior. Their behavior is completely correlated to their thought. So what happens is someone gets triggered by a situation. Okay. So that situation could be going to mom, you know, family dinner and fam family dinners always triggered overeating, let's call it social eating. So they get to this trigger situation and then they act out um, on a behavior, which might be to overindulge, but they're not acting out on the situation. They're acting out on an interpretation of that situation. So their thought associated with that situation. And that thought tends to be part of like their schema or how they see themselves in the world. So what I help people do is A, understand what are your automatic thoughts that are going on in these trigger situations and how can we reframe them to be more balanced? And so when people have more balanced thinking, they can have more balanced behavior and they could change their behavior. You know, so this is done over a series of, of sessions together, but it's so awesome to really see that people really do get over time that it's their thinking that influences their behavior, not the situation. Right. And it, it's so interesting that you actually bring up the quote unquote family dinner, because mm -hmm. I, I actually find <laughs> that the family of origin is a massive mm -hmm obstacle mm -hmm. to success for weight loss patients like we're mm -hmm. doing really well and everything's mm -hmm. a go and I went to see my parents on the weekend mm -hmm. and you know there was shame there was like a, they, it's it's often not a supportive environment what kind of tools can you no. give people to navigate mm -hmm. that I'm going home to see mom and I'm breaking it to her that I'm on a paleo diet mm -hmm. you know what yes I want, I want to answer that but something just a, like a, as a little thing before that it's so interesting because I the family of origin, you're so right, is such a, it's such a sensitive area, especially with weight loss, because shame, guilt, core belief all stems from family of origin, you know, so things like I'm not good enough, or I can't do this, I'm incompetent, I'm helpless, I'm hopeless, all those core beliefs, they all start from family of origin. So often being around family triggers this behavior, like childlike behavior, adolescence, you know, rebellion or things that you did when you were a teenager. Um, and so people really do lose control. And I see it with my clients all the time, like to your point, Megan, they'll be doing amazing. And then especially, you know, a lot of cultures wrap love and everything in connection around food. Well, and I come from a Russian Jewish background, so everything is about food and my mom, all she does is overfeed. So one of the strategies I give people is more one of the tools is I actually create a real strategy for them around what they're going to do when they get home, like, or to their parents' house. Like, for example, you know, if you're going there at six o'clock, here's what you're going to do before you go. Here's the plan that you're going to do when you're there. Here are the thought, what you're going to do with the thoughts that come up. Here's what you're going to say to your parents. So I really kind of create a very comprehensive strategy for them so that they have so many tools available to them when they're in that situation, in that environment. Right. You kind of test them out and get to practice. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. And you can do exposure therapy. You can do all sorts of, but you could just even do things like, you know, let's make sure that you have like a protein and a healthy snack before you go so that you're not hungry. Let's also make sure that you give yourself some kind of guidelines. Like, 
you know, what's the favorite thing that you, that your mom makes that you just absolutely can't say no to. Okay. Have some of that, but what can you say no to? They're like, well, I don't care about mashed potatoes. Okay. Forget the mashed potatoes, but you really love your mom's peach pie. Okay. Have a slice of that without guilt. The other piece kind of to your point around guilt and shame is when that's entrenched into all of that, it is such a negative emotion that I really work with clients that guilt and shame is such a a useless emotion, you know? So if you're going to make a choice to have a kind of treat when you're there, make that choice consciously, choose it and don't feel guilty about it. Yeah. So to that point, how do we navigate, how do we navigate treats? So you have a crummy Mm -hmm. day, you're Mm -hmm. PMSing, stuff's hitting the fan and all you Mm -hmm. want is like that bowl of ice cream or that bag of chips or you're like you just like you're living for that that thing how else Mm -hmm. how do we trigger that dopamine what's the new conversation that we start to have so that we Mm -hmm. have a different pleasure center at the end of a bad day so a couple things that I tell clients especially people that are nighttime eaters or nighttime is when people are more susceptible and more vulnerable in general and then eating night eating pattern is is very common uh, especially with the executive entrepreneurial uh, population because if you think about it when you were in university and stuff like that, people used to study late at night and they would eat to also keep themselves awake, to give themselves an insulin rush, right? So one of the things I talk to people about is what do you do when you get home from work? Like, where do you sit? Do you watch TV? How's your house set up? So we actually break it down like, like you're living in a Pavlovian condition response. If every time you are triggered to eat and it's 9 p.m. and you're in front of the TV, guess what? You have an association with the TV and the room you're sitting in. So one of the replacement behaviors I tell clients is what are some other ways that you can trigger dopamine or relax in release endorphins is like taking a bath, a warm bath, like, you know, reading a book or going for a walk around the block after dinner, basically changing the behavior that you're constantly doing is going to start to create new neural networks and new pathways in your brain, you know, so Um, you know, I have clients like set alarms on their phone that is going to be around the time they're triggered to eat to give them that notification to go do something else, go take a hot bath or something like that. Yeah, that's so smart because sometimes you just have to get yourself out of that traditional pattern. It's all about your brain. As you know, like it's, it's so great. It's automatic. It's automatic. It's so great at running a pattern. Um, but the brain is also so able to create new patterns, but you just have to consciously choose that, you know, first of all, part of it is bringing awareness to the pattern. Most people, um, and I know you know this this population, they're so unaware of their body sensations and what they're thinking and feeling and doing. They're kind of like oftentimes like a bit robotic because they just don't they don't get it unless they're quite conscious to it. So sometimes they don't even understand that there's a pattern going on. They just think that it's by coincidence that every night at 9 p.m. they want to go eat, you know, ice cream. And then when you bring, when you shed light to it and say, Hey, like, don't you notice it's that interesting that at nine o'clock that's your trigger. Okay. Well, what if at eight 45, you leave that room and you go run yourself a bath and you do that for the next week. Can you commit to that for one week? And they say, well, yeah, I could pretty much do anything for one week. Okay, great. Let's do that. And let's see how that goes for this week. And you know what? Most of them report 99% of the time is that the craving for that starts to dissipate because it's not associated with, you're not eating in the bathtub. Same thing with if you ever notice, like, you know, I never watch TV in bed, but I only watch TV in the living room. When I go to my bedroom, I don't crave food. So there's really an understanding of that there's a, like a condition response to where they're normally running that behavior. Yeah, it makes so much sense. And I'm just thinking about all these people at the office who are like, I get to the office, there's a big bag of candy, everyone brings mm-hmm. their donuts. I have to walk mm-hmm. by it. I have to be, I have to be polite. <laughs> you have to pick a new route. Mm-hmm, totally. You have to pick a new route. And this happens, that's a conversation I have with clients all the time. And what I say is, yes, you should pick a new route. Um, And B, you need to enroll people around you in what you're doing. So to your point around, you know, when you go to family dinner, if you pretend you're not trying to eat healthy, people aren't going to know how to be around you unless you tell them this is what you're up to. So, you know, when you're around your colleagues at work and you let them know, hey, listen, I'm not, I'm trying not to eat sugar right now you know, maybe people will be more mindful and not put sugar out everywhere. So I think sort of telling people what you're up to is really important. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because when you are accountable, you're helpable, right? You Mm -hmm. need, you need people around you. Let's talk about food a little bit. Do you have, do you have a a particular, I'm like reticent to say it, but do you have a particular Mm -hmm. dietary (laughs) philosophy that Mm -hmm. you adhere to with your clients that you have found to be more successful generally Mm -hmm. respecting the fact that people have different ways that they, they Mm -hmm. want to eat? 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So I would say my, the philosophy that I adhere to the most is probably more of a paleo style diet. Um, I really love intermittent fasting for our demographic, uh, demographic of people because most of them are quite sedentary and intermittent fasting has so much research around, you know, you know, uh, better for di digestive care and your gut, um, actually helping your cortisol levels. A lot of times our executive clients run out of the house and breakfast is, is kind of a pain in the butt for them. So this really helps them not have to worry about that first meal. So I would say paleo based with an intermittent fasting and a bit of carb backloading. So a little bit of carbohydrates at their last meal to help uh, regulate their serotonin and help them sleep better at night. Also really helpful for people that are nighttime eaters to have a carb with their dinner, I find helps them feel more sated and they're not like looking in the cupboards for more stuff. Um, that's generally the philosophy I, I, I would subscribe to just from the sense of like insulin regulation and, and sustainability. Um, and that's probably what I would, you know, say most of my clients are on a variation of those kinds of philosophies. You know, I don't, you know, I, I always say like, I'm not, you know, Weight Watchers and I don't love calorie counting, but at the same time, I think it's really important to understand that calories are just a unit of measure and that an energy in the body. And basically I still do like to talk about portion sizes and a little bit of calorie counting is implied in the way that I teach my clients to eat because there really is this whole idea too, that some people feel that if they're eating healthy, they can eat as much as they want. And that's unfortunately just not true. You know, a six ounce piece of chicken breast is a lot more calories than a three ounce piece. And so I find that talking about portions and calories inside of a paleo diet is really important. Yeah, I think that philosophy of counting every last calorie and macronutrienting your day um, mm -mm. is a little bit is a little bit passe. But mm -hmm. I mean, you're right. You're having ten avocados a day. You're having you're having a lot of energy, and your body's mm -hmm. going to want to do something with it. I, I find what you're saying really interesting because I think a few years ago people were they were they were avoiding all carbs all the time, and I'm seeing mm -hmm. more and more success and more and more people coming in saying have a little bit of carb with dinner, and that's mm -hmm. kind of making me happy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and sleepy. One question for you do you mm -hmm. find women respond differently to this type of uh, intervention with respect to diet differently than men in what in what regard well i just i i have found that a ketogenic approach to women is slightly different depending on uh, the estrogen environment like for men mm -hmm. it works really really well and for women mm -hmm. i'm like it should be mm -hmm. it should work well but for some people mm -hmm. it does not i'm just curious that your experience totally. with that i would tell you that my experience with that and I'll use myself as an experience. So, you know, you know, I've talked about this at length, but like I'm, you know, after I had a baby, I'm leaner than I was uh, before. And I think I actually fell into that category of a bit of that health halo effect of I can eat the, as big of a portion as I want of healthy food. And I was really, really resi like resistant to eating carbs. Like I'd really try to not eat any starchy carbohydrates. So I had a very much an exclusively paleo diet, okay? And I find to your point with men, a ketogenic diet or paleo, carb backloading, all that, intermittent fasting works so well, really reduces especially uh, belly fat and they just get really lean quite quickly. And with women, I do think that they actually need a lot more carbohydrates than they think because I think they down-regulate their thyroid so much. And I think I was of that... I was that person. I think I was so afraid to eat carbs. I think I was so kind of in that world in the fitness industry and the nutrition. And I was so like scared of carbs. And after I had a child and my body sort of, as I was pregnant, I was eating more carbohydrates. And now I've continued to have them, you know, throughout the day a little bit more, you know, again, portion controlled. And it just works. I find that women, when they don't eat carbohydrates, they tend to eat bigger portions of protein and fat. So they're eating more calories. And I think when they have a bit of carbs with their meals, they're more satisfied. So they end up eating less and more balanced. So I think in general, you're right. I think that I've actually, um, with my female clients, I've been testing, putting in a little bit more carbohydrates throughout their day. And I think that it's been working a lot better to your point. Yeah. And, and also just for the sake of preventing diabetes, mm -hmm. we're not talking about refined carbohydrates. No, we're no. talking about cellular <laughs> carbohydrates, like the whole mm -hmm. food that happened mm -hmm. to be carbs, not the, oh. not the mm -hmm. refined. No, no, no. We're pretzels. talking about, yeah, we're talking about sweet potato. We're talking about, you know, the high fiber, um, healthy, healthy starches, you know, brown, the brown rice, the quinoa, you know, all those kinds of, of course, like healthy, healthy carbs. Um, but again, you know, to that point, I would say this, that a lot of our clients who are entrepreneurs um, and aren't cooking their own meals 
and are having to go to, you know, somewhere downtown to get their food, you know, as much as I don't love people eating bread, sometimes, you know, the reality is that they can, they, all they can get is like a really healthy whole wheat wrap with turkey. And yes, it's not ideal that they're eating maybe a processed wrap, but it's better than some of the other alternatives. So I often feel that my approach has really shifted when I've worked with this demographic, that it's not all or nothing. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be, you know, a healthier choice than what they were making before, uh, all things considered. Yeah, absolutely. You've always, you've got to be aiming for progress, not perfection, right? Totally progress, not perfection. But but real food, because the one thing I'm just going to caution all of you people listening is that the one thing my entrepreneurs are really good at is finding loopholes. And Mm -hmm. so if I say we're going to go gluten-free, for a lot of them, gluten-free is like all the refined gluten-free foods or, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and it's the principle here we're talking about is, is aiming towards real food as much as possible. So don't totally. let our commentary provide you with an out. <laughs> I, do, I, <laughs> no, have to, no, no. I have to say it. I have to say it out loud. And then, yes. and then people tend to stick to it. Um, mm-hmm. How do you break the cycle of a yo-yo dieter? I think you show them a better way. So often the people that I've had that have come to see me have done, I call them professional dieters, not even yo-yo dieters. They've done, <laughs> I like it. They, they know more about calorie counting than I do. They know more about macronutrients than I, you know, they've been on Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or they've done Dr. Bernstein. They've done, uh, you know, myriad of different approaches and they've lost and gained and gained and lost and screwed up their thyroid and everything else. And so I think how you stop yo-yo dieting is every client that I've worked with who's lost the weight and kept it off stops becoming, stops being a yo-yo dieter because they've now reached a sustainable weight. Um, it's healthy. It fits their lifestyle. They don't feel deprived. They get to live, you know, and so they don't have that need to go up and down anymore. All the other things that they're doing, like that don't work because they're not sustainable. I think that's what keeps them looking for other approaches. It's just that nothing's really worked and stuck for them. Right. I, you know, I want to, I, the, there's the yo-yo dieting because I'm trying to lose weight. And then there is the, um, the diet dabbling where I'm paleo, I'm vegan. I'm, mm-hmm. um, and I, you know, I want to, I want to talk about, I want to talk about the vegans and vegetarians for a second, because I actually find mm-hmm. this is a population that very early on, often, often because of social conscious reasons, they made a decision not to consume animal products or, or change their ratios, uh, mm-hmm. thereof. And it didn't have the, 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 the body management, uh, weight management, um, outcome that they were thinking, how do you manage mm-hmm. vegans with respect to mm-hmm. weight loss mm-hmm. with complete respect for that. where they're at? But it, it it's, it's totally. different. It's a, it's a different approach. Yeah. It, it's such a great question, Megan. I, I literally, um, was talking about that the other day with, um, one of my, um, one of my associates and she was, so we, she also uh, graduated from the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. And what happens when you go to that school is that just like probably how you experience when you went through school is that you sort of want to try everything. You're like, Oh, I'll try being a vegan and I'll try being this. I'll try that. Cause you, you learn, you have so much knowledge and you want to try things. And so she was vegan for many, many years. And it's funny. She, um, struggled with her weight and she had no energy and it was really tough. It was tough for her. And then she started eating um, protein again and started to feel better. So when clients come to me who are vegetarian or vegan, I always ask them first, are you doing this for ethical reasons and moral reasons? Or are you doing this to lose weight? Because sometimes people think that to be, if they become a vegetarian or vegan, they'll lose weight. And so if they say to me, I'm doing it to lose weight, then I'll explain to them why that's actually not the best way to go about it. If they're doing it for ethical reasons, I have to work within those parameters. But yes, you're right. It's harder. You know, when you're vegan, you have to eat more grains. You have to eat more starch. It's hard to get the same level of protein, but it's not impossible. Um, Often vegans who come to me, I don't have a lot, but I've worked with probably a handful. They're doing a lot of just a lot of carbs altogether and they're not doing it in a balanced way. So just even teaching them how to combine proteins to make them more complete. Um, what are the better sources of carbohydrates? So they'll still get results, but it is, it is hard to eat as a vegan, um, and to have a good body weight management situation. I find it very challenging, especially for women. Right. And I want to be really conscious in this conversation that we are not, we're not just talking about weight loss. And the goal is not that we're getting everyone to a place where they're, they're skinny mini with respect to weight. In fact, you know, my, my goal for people is actually that they're loving 
their bodies. Their bodies. Right. Totally, and me so too. like mm-hmm. let's put that lens on it. What mm-hmm. th- what three action steps can people start today to help kickstart their optimal body image? Hmm. Their optimal body image. Well, I think really asking yourself, like, what is, uh, one thing I always ask my clients is like, when did you feel the best? How, like what, wh- you know, what's the best version of yourself? So not just tying it to their weight. And I don't even use weight as, a, as my only metric. I talk about energy. I talk about vitality. I talk about, you know, sort of body fat, um, you know, body fat ratios and all that kind of stuff. And so I think how you start a really good body image conversation is, where do you, in your mind's eye, what do you feel and look like at your best? And so it might be something like, I want to be able to go to the gym five times a week and lift weights with my trainer. I want to run a marathon. I want to do this. I want to do that. So it's not just tied to a number, but it is really about what matters to them. And I think, I think you, to your point, it's not about getting everyone skinny mini. I think it's getting them to a point where they're healthy and it's sustainable. So, you know, if I say to a client, what's your optimal weight. Um, and they say, you know, some number and I say, well, have you ever been there before? And they're like, no, I'm like, okay, well then maybe we should, we need to really talk about that. And why is that, an, why that, why that, that number is important to you? And let's maybe find something a bit more balanced. So I'm to your point, I'm very much about something being manageable, sustainable and fitting their lifestyle. Um, when I talk to my clients. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really great. And, and I had this uh, observation in my practice recently, and I'm actually curious about your, your comment on it, but I have found that when I start to ask about weight loss, when mm-hmm. the motivation for weight loss is I want to look really good and I have these pants I want to fit in and I'm, and I'm going to a reunion. And when it's, mm-hmm. when it's externally motivated, mm-hmm. I find it extremely difficult to make sustainable change for these people. And mm-hmm. when it is, I'm on a mission and I have stuff I want to do. Like I need my, mm-hmm. I need my body. Cause I, I want to mm-hmm. play with my kids and I want to run around like mm-hmm. done deal. They changed their mind about weight loss. And like, we are, we are, mm-hmm. we're, this is over, right? Like we can yes. get you there. How do you, mm-hmm. have you, how do you well, get there? How do you get there? Cause I'm like, I'm sure you yes. found it. It took me a long time to realize this was what was going on. You probably like knew this ages ago, but you know, how, <laughs> how do we, how do we take people from that place where like, it's yeah. not about what your girlfriends think you look like in your pants to mm-hmm. it's what you do with your body. Like, what is the yes. difference there? So there's two things I'd like to say to that. The first one is this, and this is an exercise people at home can do, and I find it really, really, really powerful. So it's called my why, the why exercise. I'm sure you've heard of it. But, you know, if someone says, like, I have a goal, like, okay, so to your point, that person says, I want to fit into pants for a, a, um, a high school reunion, okay? And I would say, okay, why, why is fitting into your size six pants important to you? They'll say, well, because I want to look good. I'll say, okay, well, what is looking good? How is looking good going to make you feel? And they'll say, I don't, it'll make me feel confident. I say, okay, what is confidence going to give you? And then they'll say, and then what happens is when you ask the why question about five times, I call it like the five layers deep, what you really get is their core value. You'll really get what really matters to them. So it'll be something like, I want to live longer. For I want to be able to play with my kids. I want to live longer. I don't want to be like my mom. I, And then it brings usually you know, you've gotten there when it brings like a tear to their eye or goosebumps, or they feel like it, something that resonated. And I do that often with goal setting because it's never the first thing that someone says. It's never, I want to look good in my size six pants. It's usually something related to their health or, you know, wanting to be play with their kids or to have that vitality, or maybe not wanting to follow the footsteps of a parent who didn't have good health, you know? So That exercise is is really important. It's one of the things I do very early on with clients to really get a sense. The second thing I was going to say to your point is about internal and external motivation. We know, like the science tells us, psychology tells us that anything that's intrinsically motivated is going to be far uh, far more sustainable and longer lasting than, than extrinsic motivation. So motivated from the outside versus the inside. But to that point, where I'm sort of like on the fence is it's not really up to me to to decide. You know, if someone wants to look good in their pants because they are going to reunion and that's actually motivating them right now, okay. And I think at the end of the day, it's up to them why they want to lose the weight. And as I start to build rapport, you know, maybe what got them in the door is that they wanted to like drop a few sizes in their clothes. But over time, what they start to uncover is what's really beneath the surface. And that doesn't always happen in one session. That happens with, as you know, with clients too, Megan, like, they build, you build rapport, they build trust, you build trust, 
the conversation deepens, where they're at changes, you know, where they're at in their journey changes, what they're open and willing to accept changes, the conversation changes. So I think I don't begrudge people that say, hey, I just want to look better in my clothes. Okay, great. Well, you're here. So that's a first step. Now let's get going. And over time, you start to see that their why deepens and their reason for being there changes. Yeah, it's such a great point. And, and I think so much of, of that psychology starts when you're young. Mm-hmm. I like imagine they grew up in a household where there was, there was conscious dialogue around that. As, mm-hmm. a, as a parent, do mm-hmm. you have conscious dialogue around what, what food does for you? And are you, are you mindful of setting an environment uh, that incorporates healthy body image? Or do you just talk about health? Like, how do you approach this? Mm -hmm. Well, my son is only one. (laughs) Um, So he's... (laughs) Okay, so in theory, (laughs) how do you plan to dialogue around this? Yes, no, but totally. Um, Listen, my house, much like I'm sure yours is, you know, so many healthy options. I don't have junk in the home. I just don't buy it and I don't subscribe to it. But I'm also such a balanced person around food. You know, Uh, What I find happens in this industry as a nutritionist is that there's often a very sort of all or nothing, you know, that everything needs to be perfect and organic and this and that. And there's kind of like a good and bad element to food. I think I'm very much around food like, and I think what ends up happening, especially with a lot of girls and body image is that either um, the mom, the moms were very strict about food and, and made it really like, this is bad, this is good or there was no rules around food. And I think my approach as my son gets older, and if I have more kids and I have a daughter, is that just to teach them to always educate them about healthy choices, letting them, you know, showing them different foods and explaining why those are better, giving them the option to choose, giving them some a balance. So it's, it's, you know, giving them a treat every now and then and not it being so like, you can't have this and you can't have that. I think just really explaining the benefits of things and letting your kids really see um, that, you know, there's no bad or good. It's really just about making better choices. And I think ultimately, really, as our responsibility as parents is to model good behavior. You know, if you're sitting there eating a bag of McDonald's, you can't tell your kids don't eat it. You know, I'm always going to be eating healthy food. So my son is always going to see that he's always going to be around it. But I can't unfortunately control all the factors of like what happens at school or what happens when he's at his grandparents' house or what happens with friends. All I can do is control, um, you know, who I am around my son and how I, um, how I model good behavior. Right. And that's and going to be 90% of the influence right there. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and he's already starting, you know, like, you know, when, when, when clients tell me, oh, my kids don't like vegetables, it's like kids kids at that age don't know what they like. They don't like anything. Like yeah. I give my son veg like he eats like raw cut up vegetables and he just like grazes on them and he loves it. Of course he's gonna love sugar if you give him sugar. But he also is gonna love broccoli if you give him broccoli. It's just training their brain early on. And I think that's so important is that especially when you just feed kids sugar so early on, you are just changing their brain so early and it becomes so much harder to kick that habit. So I am one thing I'm conscious about with my son is not giving him, not exposing him to too much sugar early on. Yeah, I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Sugar hits those pleasure centers, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the brain wants pleasure. So you show it that in abundance and that uh, mm-hmm. nothing else is going to match that biochemical response, but you're definitely not nourishing your kids. No, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, or no. or yourself, right? Like I have a secret stash of jube jubes. I won't say publicly where they're hidden, but they're hidden, and I enjoy <laughs> them. And every once in a while, I go there, but it's not uh, it, it's not a, it's not an everyday thing. This is not about nourishment, um, and it's right back no. to balance, like you talked about. Adele, totally. how how would you define health? For me, honestly, the word that always comes to mind, and I think it's such, um, it's so in line with my core belief and my values is just, is balance, like really, and being mindful. So health is being mindful of what you're doing. Like, so if you are eating those jube jubes, Megan, you're choosing it. You're being mindful of it. You know, like I'm choosing to have these jube jubes right now. I don't have them every day, but I really want them and I'm choosing it consciously. Being mindful, being conscious and being balanced to me is health. Being bad health to me isn't that person that goes to the gym, you know, twice a day and like diets and restricts and feels guilty. That's not, that's not health. You know, there's no balance in that balance is really like 
being listening to your body and, and you're, you know, sometimes it's funny. I, I don't need a ton of red meat, but sometimes I'll have this crazy craving for red meat and I'll say, well, I guess I need some iron. Like I'll have some red meat, you know, being able to even listen to your body sensations around hunger. That's health, not just eating because you're bored, actually eating because you're hungry, understanding what those cues look like. That's health. So I think health is a lot more of like a, a holistic approach. And I think it's all about really understanding your body and your body sensations and just being more mindful. I love that. I can't, uh, I can't emphasize that enough. Like just being aware of what's happening below mm-hmm. your shoulders. <laughs> just feel it. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a jackhammer before you have something going on with your health. Like it's, it's always talking to you. It's always talking to you, but that, you know, one of the things with the, the demographic, we, we work with and why I think it's what we're doing is so, so, so important and why they, why people need us is that we are there to help them have those conversations to say, you know, you know, what are, what are your body sensations? Like, where do you feel that feeling? Is it in your chest? Is it in your stomach? And at first I'll look at you like you've got two heads, but it's like, no, no, like just listen to where that feeling is. And then over time, they're able to, to really understand what their body is telling them and that your body is is infinite wisdom. You know, it, it really knows what you need. And, and I think what I'll sort of end on there is that it's why I so really don't prescribe to a one size fits all. It's really about understanding what the individual needs, just like how you work, Megan. It's so individualized. It's so specific to that. Each client and patient is different. And that's what makes what you do so powerful and unique is that you're just really, you're, you know, you're really focusing on what that person needs in that moment. And that's the same thing with me. So as much as I might prescribe more to a philosophy around paleolithic dieting, like it's really so much bigger than that. It's like, what is this person's body telling us that they need right now? What a perfect segue to the second part of the interview <laughs> okay. in terms of like listening to these key, these key performance indicators, these key little messages that your body is sending. And, and in the nature of these questions, the, the messages that we're sending back to our bodies, the things that we do every single day that, that augment and influence performance. Each month, I'm featuring a new anthropology quiz to help you unlock and uncover some of the physical performance blocks that may be holding you back from your true potential. This month, we're focusing on digestion. Why? Because it is the center of everything that happens with respect to your health. It's also something that we rarely like to talk about with our friends or colleagues. So we thought we'd put it in a quiz for you so you can have an understanding as to whether or not your bowel movements, digestion, and the way you are feeling are common or normal or amazing. To learn more or to take the quiz, head on over to meganwalker.com forward slash anthropology quiz. So these questions are meant to be sort of rapid response. I haven't thrown them out to you uh, beforehand, Um, but let's kick it off with this. Do you have a consistent morning routine? And if so, can you share? Yes. um, The gym. Oh, you in the gym. Mm Mm-hmm. Nothing gets between Adele and the gym. I I I know this about you. <laughs> Nothing gets between me and the gym. Nothing. Fiction or nonfiction? What are you reading right now? I'm reading an amazing book called Abundance, um, and it's I think you'd really love it. It's all about actually how there is abundance in the world, and that um, you know we're often scared. You know, there's a lot of doom and gloom around. We're not going to have enough water and enough uh, food and all this, but it actually is a great book around uh, the plenty in the universe. I love that. Hot, mm-hmm. hot beverage of choice. How do you prepare it and what is it? Um, hot beverage of choice would be an Americano, um, either black with cinnamon or with, with some cream. That's my girl. Uh, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do for fun or play? Um, honestly, right now, what I do for fun would be hang out with my son in the, in the small amount of time that I have to spend with him as a working mom, like taking him to the park, being in nature, going for hikes with him, carrying him in a carrier. It's like one of the things I love to do the most. Um, and I do, I do, I am a bit of a foodie myself, so I do like to try out new, uh, new restaurants around the city as well. Love it. Last question mm-hmm. for you. Entrepreneurism. Are we born this way or do we learn to become entrepreneurs? I think it's a bit of both. I think we have probably some intrinsic motivation there, some kind of, you know, maybe constitution. And then, uh, you know, I think it's kind of like 
maybe it lays dormant in you and the environment sort of triggers something. So I would say maybe it's a bit of both. Adele, it was such a pleasure to have this conversation with you I know, I loved it. (laughs) Thank you so much. What amazing questions really got me thinking. (laughs) Well, hey, that's what we're we're trying to do and trying to be all about. I know people are going to want to follow up with you um, Mm -hmm. and the work that you're doing. Where can they find you? They can find me on Adele Wellness at AdeleWellness.com. And my Instagram handle is Adele Wellness, underscore wellness, actually. Um, And and Twitter, same thing would be um, at Adele Wellness. Yeah, so that's where you can find me. Amazing. And we'll have all of your contact mm-hmm. information in uh, in the show notes so that people can follow up with the really incredible work that you are doing. Adele, Thank thanks so for much. thanks for everything that you're doing in the world and, and the amazing help that you are that you are imparting to people on a on a really regular basis. It's really incredible Thank to see. Thank you so much, Megan. Same to you. If you enjoyed our conversation and would like to hear more, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and subscribe to the Anthropology Podcast. We would also really appreciate a quick review. When people have their health, they can change the world. Let us keep you healthy and you go change the world.